My name is Matt Snyder. I'm a wildland fire training specialist for Tall Timbers Research Station. Been working there since 2018. Um, I'm really used to being in a class, and I really like to teach, but I'm used to being in a room a bit smaller than this, and I have a tendency to work in a more Socratic method rather than lecturing. I hate being talked at. Um, so I may ask some folks in the audience to give me a hand while we're working today, but I may not as well. Um, so what I'd like to do is talk about some things. I'd, I'd like to, to run this a little bit like a refresher. I'd like to bring up some things that might seem elementary, but I think are worth, worth talking about all the time. John said we don't spend enough time talking, we can't spend enough time talking about safety in wildland fire operations. So the way I chose to go about this is rather than having a discussion with a classroom, I went out and had a series of discussions with trusted friends and colleagues that have as much or more prescribed fire experience than, than I do. Um, and I asked each one of them to deliver me a key safety message. And so what I'm gonna give you is about seven or eight slides of key safety messages. If anybody has anything they'd like to add or a question they'd like to ask during the course of the next 25 minutes, 20, 25 minutes or so, please just speak up. Raise your hand, we can get a mic to you if you want. Um, and don't be surprised if I call on you, you all know who you are. So, from John McGuire, who you heard from earlier, remember that it's important to scout your unit before you start doing fire line prep work. Remember it's important to quality assure your prep work after you've completed it and, and ensure that you don't need to do it again or improve anything. You haven't left jackpots or standing snags that are gonna be a problem untreated next to the line. And then do not, please, do not drop a match in a unit until you've re-scouted it. Things can change, particularly if you do your prep well in advance, things can change. Grass grows, you get needle drop that could carry fire across your fire lines. Snags fall down, stuff blows down in the wind. Check those creeks if you're using them as holding lines. Um, the, the creek that was good a month and a half ago might be low enough next week to not keep your, your unit secure. Just like fire lines, creeks will, will take things falling across them and build fuel bridges, and the next thing you know, you're in a world of hurting. From R.T. Lumpkin, you also heard from earlier, be aggressive early and maintain tempo. So what does that mean? Uh, means to me, it means starting as early as you possibly can, as early as, as the unit will, will carry fires as soon as the fuels become available. It allows you to work on your downwind side early and take care of that downwind problem and then be able to start working things into the wind. The last thing that you want to do is to, the last thing you want to do is to increase, be forced to increase tempo, to start doing things at a, more, at a higher pace and start setting yourself up for things to fall into the cracks when you get into the height of the burning period. We know that organizations are very vulnerable during times of tempo change. So it's very important to think about not changing tempo early or not changing tempo late in your operation, excuse me. Um, tempo, for those of you, who, is the pace that we work against the pace of the environment changing around us. Be thinking about where you want to be at the height of the burning period, start making adjustments early before you get there. Kevin Hires tells us to go find a designated skeptic. The designated skeptic is somebody that can challenge your thinking and help you crystallize your thoughts. And it can be somebody that might be the person that says, hey, you know, you don't want to do it today. There, there's a day to shoot that arrow and there's a day to leave it in the quiver. You want somebody, a trust, what Kevin refers to as a trusted agent, somebody that will be honest with you, somebody that will, act, that will challenge your thinking 
and ask you to think about things in a different light and it can help crystallize your thinking. And that can be somebody that tells you to put the brakes on or slow down or maybe make a different decision or it can be the exact converse of that. In 2018, when I was working on the Chattahoochee Fall Line project, um, I woke up one morning, stiff breeze. We planned to burn a unit that day, pretty stiff breeze blowing. I looked at the forecast and the, the top of the forecast said, Fort Benning is forecasted to have a category four day today. The relative humidities were expected to drop down into the mid to high 20s, which was in the hot part of my prescription. The wind was right at the top end of my prescription. And I called Eric Brown. And, and I showed up at the crew house and all the seasonals, most of whom didn't have a ton of experience, were looking at me like their eyes were the size of dinner plates. What, what do you think of why are we going to do this today? So I called Eric and I said, hey, we're, we're looking at a category four day. It's high winds, low relative humidity. And Eric's only response was, well, it sounds like a really good day to burn that unit, Matt. And that was kind of what I needed to hear in, in, that, in that moment, in that context. I needed somebody to say, you can do this. Just think about how you're going to do it. We walked out and we walked it into the wind all day. It took a little more patience. But if I hadn't had somebody to tell me, you do know how to do this and you can, I probably would have left the drip torches in the truck for that day. A designated skeptic can help you avoid confirmation bias. Confirmation bias is, a, is an absolute killer in our business. If you're only looking for what you know to be true, you are never going to find unexpected things. And that is where we get in trouble in wildland fire management. We are not anticipating the unexpected and we're not building systems that contain, that can contain unexpected or unfavorable events. Zach Prusak, my colleague in Florida, who is sitting in the dark watching it rain in Orlando, and hopefully not wearing a life jacket right now, reminds us to don't overlook secondary control features within your unit. There's often skid trails or secondary roads, um, creeks, any number of things that you can use to break up a unit, make it smaller, make it more manageable, or a place that you can hang it up if, if change happens quickly on you, if things start to deteriorate. Always important to find a way that you can adjust to a dynamic environment and keep people and the environments around you safe. My recommended recommendation is if you have time and the energy to do it, prep most of those interior control features if you can. Have them ready to go so the day that you go out and you get a big wind switch or the RH drops on you faster than you think it's going to, you don't have to put a bunch of work into it. Again, it's about avoiding confirmation bias and building systems that are resilient, that are always thinking about failure. It's that, it's that part of high reliability organizing that sounds counterintuitive to us. Um, high rel highly reliable organizations are preoccupied with failure. And that sounds like... When you look at it at face value, it sounds like you're saying these organizations are just sitting in a corner and, and worrying. And that's not the case. A highly reliable organization is preoccupied with failure in that it's always thinking about what can go wrong. And it has an answer for, for everything that can go wrong. And it might not be a script answer. It may be something that needs to be done on the fly. But if you're thinking about what can go wrong, you're, you have an opportunity to react to things much faster and you have more decision space. Shan Kamek reminds us to stay hydrated. We all know what it's like when you get dehydrated, right? You get a headache, you start to feel a little nauseated, and you certainly know that your thinking gets clouded. So I went and looked for some studies that prove that Inadequate hydration can impair cognitive ability, and the jury is out on it scientifically. It hasn't been studied enough yet. However, know that you're not making as good of decisions when you're dry. You need to stay hydrated. You need to keep the people around you hydrated. Because what you don't want to do is add complexity to an operation 
by creating an incident within an incident medical situation. If you got somebody that goes down with dehydration or a heat-related injury, then you're taking at least two people out of your organization because you've got that first person who's become a patient and somebody else has to take, at least one other person has to take care of them. So now you're down two. And if you've got a very short organization, that can get real complex in a big, big hurry. So remind people to stay hydrated. How much, anybody in the audience, what do you need for one day on the fire line? How much water should you be drinking? John. I don't know, I get kidney stones all the time. John doesn't drink water. I heard somebody say a gallon, that's about right, right? More if it's real hot, much more if it's super dry. <laughs> Pardon me. Lastly, and I'm way ahead of schedule here, so I'm, I'll be happy to take questions or start a different discussion. Uh, Joe O'Brien at Southern Research Station reminds us that the rain is not always drought relief. Um, some of the studies that he's done suggest that duff becomes hydrophobic during the extended periods of drought, and then it becomes much, much harder for that duff to take up moisture after uh, precipitation begins. Of course, woody debris acts much the same way. And what we do know is there's a huge lag between precipitation and moisture change within coarse woody debris or duff. There's a, there's a major lag because that hydrophobicity has to be broken down before the fuels are gonna to start to take up moisture and before they're gonna start becoming less and less available. Uh, if you read the Las Dispensas um, prescribed fire escape report, fire that turned into the Calf Canyon Hermit Peak fire this spring in New Mexico, this is one of the contributing factors to that fire that escaped, ran to 300,000 acres and burnt somewhere on the order of 350, 400 structures, uh, destroyed whole watersheds for the city of Las Vegas, New Mexico. Um, they did not, they got some decent moisture after a long period of drought and probably let their guard down just a bit. Probably thought, you know, maybe this is some relief. Do not mistake a bit of rain, a bit of atmospheric moisture for true drought relief. It takes a lot longer than a couple days of rain. And it's, and it's really a difference in how that rain comes, right? You want a slow wetting rain as opposed to cascades of monsoonal moisture, um, even better snow over the winter if you're in the mountains. Um, but in the presence of long-term drought, do not let your guard down if you start getting some a little bit of moisture and think that you're all good and okay. It's essentially what I've got. It happened a lot faster than I thought it was going to. Questions? Neil. Yeah, it's a great reminder, you know, um, particularly if you're coming out of long-term drought, having rain post-operational is nearly as important as having rain pre-operational. Yeah, thank you, Neil, very much. Anybody else? My work here is done. Thank you very much. Thank you.